I never, ever, ever <laughs> take market conditions into, into any decision, creative decision I make, ever. I'm making the thing that I want to feel, whatever it is. And then, and, and, the, and that's not because I don't care about the audience or I don't care about the business. I know that if I feel it, that's my best chance of someone else feeling it. Rick Rubin, welcome to Point Forward. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure, sir. I always see you, you know, just dropping a lot of wisdom. So, you know, for me, super excited that we get to talk to you today. Try my best. <laughs> you know, you look comfortable. Where are you at in Costa Rica? Yeah. I, I went for a long time in my life without taking any vacations. And then I started taking vacations just to like not work for a, you know, a week or two. Yeah. And then realized that I do as much mental work when I'm not in the studio and then decided to arrange my life to where I'm living in places where it always feels like I'm on vacation yet I'm working all the time and it feels good. I first had that experience moving from New York to Los Angeles. And when I moved to Los Angeles, it felt like vacation compared to living in New York, even though I was still in the recording studio for 12 hours. It, yeah. Something about when you walk outside and sunshine and yeah, that's real. just different feeling. So um, then I ended up moving to LA and it, it never, that feeling of um, being able to work all day, but still get the feeling of being on vacation. I've had that now consistently since moving out of new york really yeah, no that's right I, I know even when i played on the east coast even just going to go play in la like just the feeling when we landed like guys were jumping higher running a little bit faster the coaches were smiling and it was like that energy the vibe really you know really fed into the game and fed into the players so i i comprehend the environment kind of makes you sometimes so i'm envious of uh you know the work play situation there's an Drake. interesting, it was an interesting study of where the best athletes come from and where the best writers come from. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the best, like musical writers, they're, you know, for in music, it would be like people like Neil Young, Leonard Cohn. Um, everyone seems to come from a cold place where the winter is really cold and they spend a lot of time indoors yeah. alone thinking. And then the best athletes tend to come from warmer climates. People from the South do really good. And it's just something to do with where you grow up. If you spend a lot of time out in the sun and running around, you're more athletic than if you spend a lot of time, you know, in your room because it's too cold to be outside in the winter. It's fascinating. No, what about feeling. Russian? Yeah. What about Russian athletes? <laughs> they just I train. I, I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they do it. I'd like to learn more about that because they seem to be good. <laughs> nah, no, they're very good. I, I feel like in the Midwest, so I always, me and Dre are from the Midwest, but I feel as though we figure it out. It's a lot of great athletes that come from there. We we figure it out somehow. Or it's, more like, it's more like a cult in yeah. the Midwest. Where in the Midwest? I'm from Chicago. And I'm from Springfield, Illinois, so we're not too mm -hmm. far from each other. Close. Yeah. What was what was the music you guys listened to growing up? I was I was in the dip set, so like Cameron. <laughs> I was into uh obviously Eminem, you know, 50 Cent, Hove, of course. Uh I was a big DMX fan. That was that was hip hop wise, that was that was pretty much it. Then we I mean you do crossovers, of course. I was like the typical like John Mayers and those type of guys. But, but ET, you're not giving yourself enough credit and to your mother too, because we know a lot of music genres. And so we yeah, can go true. back, like we can go back and we know about, it's you know, Mar town. yeah, we know about Marvin Gaye, you know, obviously we know a lot about Michael Jackson. We know about Prince, you know, we know about James Brown, you know, uh, Maxwell was played a lot in my household. Like yeah. real, real R&B was played in the my household. The Temptations, right. and Fire. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 that, yeah, 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 yeah. And but, right, yeah. I, and but but so you, I think it helps us appreciate it. Did you see it as the same, or did you see the R and B as your parents' music and the hip hop as your music? Or I, I don't want to put that idea in your head. Actually, I'm just asking. Did, did you see them as one thing or as different things? 
I saw it as different things because like, as my mom would say, or like the old folks would say, it'd be like, now this is music. And respectfully yeah. enough, it was like to stay within like my bounds, to stay within like my everyday life. Like I comprehended that like what my mom listened to was like music. And then like, of course, you know, with hip hop, it was music for me. But I, I like the Motown days, like Temptation, all that was, that takes you back to like a crazy, just dope time. You know what I mean? Like in my personal opinion. Cool. How about yeah. you? Do you think it's the same? Uh, I think it's all, I, I like um, all kinds of music in the same way. I, I don't think it's the same, but they hit me when it's good. It hits me in the same way, like a great, um, a great R&B record or a great rock record or a great hip hop record can hit me in the same way. Great classical music for that matter mm. can hit me in the way of just like, I want to close my eyes and disappear into the music. I love that, that mm. feeling of being taken away by the music. Yeah. I read something that you were saying that like, I guess technically you don't think you're the best at like, like musically, but you, you're so confident in your taste and you're so confident in what you, you know, you know what you like, where did that come from? And how did you get that type of confidence just to stand alone? Because a lot of people, they'll, they'll lie to kick it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm not sure how it happened. I think being an only child is one thing. So I didn't have, you know, brothers and sisters around. Okay. And because of that, I spent a lot of time listening to music by myself growing up. And so there wasn't much peer pressure. I also didn't have that many friends. Honestly, when I was a kid, it was kind of shy uh, by myself a lot. So, and I like things that a lot of other kids in school didn't like. I liked punk rock when it was happening. And there were, yeah. I was the only punk rocker in my school. And when I started liking hip hop, there were maybe three kids in my school who liked hip hop. Nobody else liked it. So... I didn't have the older brother whose taste I was getting fed. And um, and I liked the idea of music that was happening now. So most of the kids in my high school liked, let's say, Led Zeppelin and The Doors. But Led's, Jim Morrison was dead. John Bonham died while I was in high school. You couldn't go out and see those bands. It felt like it was from another era. Whereas punk rock was happening right then and I could go and see the Ramones or I could see Minor Threat or whatever these bands were and it felt more like this is happening right now. And I like that um, it felt like it was r real because it was now somehow for me. Um, I don't know, never really thought about it before, but I think that's that's what it is. Something about in the moment knowing, oh, they're making this music right now and I can go see this and it's not from the past, it's not historic. It seemed to mean something to me when I was a kid. So I, I want to touch on that. You know, you speak about in the now and in your book, you know, The Creative Act, it's almost like a daily manual we can connect with. And you're speaking, you know, we'll get into, to you know meditation but you were first to really bring that to the culture you know considering how you've embedded yourself into the culture with your you know your, your music history um but when you say living the now when did it occur to you or when were you aware that this is something that people have to identify more and more with because now we're in the we're in the age where it's instant gratification. You know, we don't do things for the now. We don't do things to uh, in, enjoy the day. You know, you were talking about in your book, you may see something 10 times, but you should really appreciate it all 10 times. Uh, I, th I think because I started meditating when I was young, it allowed me to, it was like a reset button. <laughs> so after meditating, when you, when, when you come out of meditation, it's kind of like waking up into a new world. It's still the same world, but it really is like when you wake up in the morning, but there's something different about when you meditate, when you come back and you, it, it feels like you could see things more clearly and more, it, it's like you get out of your own head and you mm -hmm. start seeing what's around you. And then I've done these other meditations, but the earliest meditation I did was a mantra meditation with my eyes closed. But then I've done these other awareness meditations where you practice paying attention to what's around you. And it's fascinating. It's interesting, you know, if you close your eyes and listen to what sounds you can hear in the room that you're in and then what sounds you can hear even while you're sitting there from outside and differenti differentiating the different sounds 
that are coming at you all the time. Um, you start noticing little things it's like the sound of when the power goes out and you're aware that the sound of the refrigerator is off, <laughs> but when power comes back on, it goes, and it's like, wow, that sounds on all the time. And I never notice it because it's on all the time. And I just, my brain erases it. So we, we are, we erase the things that are ever present. It's one of the, um, it's one of the interesting things in music production. Another thing I've never talked about before, but I learned early on with drums that if the drums are playing a very straightforward pattern and not doing anything to draw you away from that pattern. So in other words, if the drummer's playing a beat, but not playing any fills, but just playing the beat, you can make that beat very, very, very loud compared to everything else that's going on. And it doesn't, you still hear everything else that's happening, even though the drums are loud, because the drums never, the drummer never does anything to get you to look back at the drums. So once it's established that the drums are going and the drums are loud, as long as there's no da 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 da, da <laughs> to make me listen to the drums again, the drums sort of disappear. Now you still feel it, you could still dance to it, but you don't focus on it because it's unchanging. And um, and it's interesting when when in production, often we'll do things purposely, like most musicians like to show how good they could play. And different people play and they play kind of showing what they can do. And if you have a bunch of people doing that, sometimes it works out, but also sometimes it's, there's a lot of conflict in this guy's trying this thing that to, to get your ear and someone else is trying this thing to get your ear and you don't know where to focus. Whereas yeah. when we, when we get things really simple, then when something changes, you're really aware of it and you're really paying attention to it. And it's one of the things about hip hop that what's so interesting about it is how uniform often the tracks are from the earliest days it might be, you know, a drum machine based beat doesn't change so much. So you can have that happen and then the lyrics start getting really important in a way that if the music was doing more to take your ear, you wouldn't listen to the words in the same way. So the, the lyrics in hip hop were able to sink in in a way that traditional songwriting weren't able to because of how, how repetitious the music was and allowed you to focus on the vocals. That's crazy. So you, you you spoke on repetition. We're wondering, you know, we see a genius now. We see somebody that's, you know, in a, you know, in full form. But what was your prep process like as a kid? We know you had a, you know, eclectic, you know, vibe in regards to the type of music you listen to. But how did you get to this point of being able to identify and uh, identify music, but at the same time, you know get deeper into it and, and really mold it the way that you have you you've had an invaluable contribution to hip-hop so where where did all that start it's it really is a matter of taste and and it's it's simple if if you have a choice of if you're going out uh if you're buying sneakers and you go to the store and there's a choice between two sneakers and you're picking the one you like better you know which one you like better you know what i mean you know yeah. which one you like it's it really is as simple as that it's like being able to say i'll try on a couple of different jackets oh this is the one i like so it's it's being and not thinking past which is the one i like not oh, i wonder what my friends are going to think of this jacket i wonder if this jacket's going to photograph well i wonder you know you don't think about any of that you just think about which is the one that i want to wear without any any secondary stuff so if you're making when i hear a piece of music I don't think, is anyone else going to like this? I don't care. You know, I, I just want to know right. if I like it. And if I like it enough to want to play it for my friends, I really like it because I like it enough to play it for my friends. There's no higher, you know, there's no higher degree of liking something than wanting to share it with your friends. So yeah. if I want to play it for my friends, I'd certainly feel good about sharing it with other people who I don't even know. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> if my friends, if I'm going to play it for my friends, it's, it's going to be great, you know, in my mind. Even if it's crazy, it doesn't matter. If you care enough to share it with your friends, it's a good sign that you really feel it. 
That's true. And do you feel that same way when it comes down to critiquing? Because obviously you got into a, an industry where it was heavily a black, you know, heavily black. So did you ever feel a certain type of way of, of sitting back and being like, hey, I might be nervous to critique because this is technically a black, a black, you know, a black culture. How'd you break into that? At the time that I started, there were no white people involved in hip hop whatsoever, really. So right. in some ways I was a novelty. The fact that I was white and I liked hip hop was an, anom an anomaly. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the fact that I could have a conversation well-versed in this thing that nobody white liked, <laughs> it was like I was very quickly accepted because we all loved the same thing. We were talking about yeah. the same thing. We loved it. It wasn't, didn't matter. It didn't, I happened to be white, but that didn't matter at all because we all love hip hop. And there were plenty yeah. of black people who hated hip hop at that time. Yeah, you know, it was, true. it still was a minority group who liked hip hop. So, and you didn't hear, you didn't hear hip hop on black radio ever. It was not because black radio looked down on hip hop music. Yeah, <laughs> even to the '90s, yeah, for sure. How they did Snoop yeah. Dogg, everybody. Yes, yeah, I remember and the, that. The first, the first places that played hip hop would be like college stations, and then maybe alt, on occasion alternative stations. Um, a rock station, WBCN in in Boston, played uh, Run DMC and Aerosmith doing "Walk This Way," mm -hmm. which really, it, the first week it happened, it infuriated the audience because they just like rock music, and then the, this rap music song, they hated it. And they, you know, the phones lit up, turned this garbage off. And then the next week, it was the most requested song on the station. And it it broke on a rock station, not on a rap station. And that allowed rap to start playing on black stations. So, so take me back, actually, because obviously you were talking about going to places and trying to listen to hip hop. Take me back to when you first met Russell Simmons, because he helped you further you had the same level of hip-hop as you of course but you guys were able to do some amazing things to move forward tell me about that time in 1984. yeah he was russell was already russell and he already managed run dmc curtis blow he managed everybody in hip-hop and was a a big fish in a very small pond because the hip-hop pond was small but nonetheless if you were looking for anything related to hip-hop he was the kingpin of hip-hop and I was a kid in my dorm room at NYU and loved hip hop. And I made, uh, the first record I made was called It's Yours by T. Rock and Jazzy J before I met Russell. And then that, um, that came out and over, it took a long time, it took like nine months before it really caught on. Um, but it caught on in a big way in New York. And, um, and I remember then I was invited to a party. There was a TV show called Graffiti Rock that um, that Treacherous 3 and Run DMC appeared on. And they had a party in a loft in somewhere in New York. And I went to this party. And then someone introduced me to Russell. And, um, and the person who introduced me said, oh, yeah, this is Rick. He made that It's Yours record that you like. And he looked at me and he was shocked because I was white. He's like, <laughs> you couldn't have made that. <laughs> He's like... <laughs> That's the, it's the blackest record I've ever heard in my life. How did you make that? Can't be. <laughs> and, um, and I said, I don't know. I just love this music. I was trying to make what, when I went to the club, this is what it feels like to me. I was trying to make the thing that felt like what I am at, what it, it feels like. Cause most of the rap records didn't sound like what the club sounded like. The, the rap records at that time sounded like R and B records with somebody rapping. But at the club, it was DJs and breakbeats, and it was it was hip hop culture at the club. Yeah. Whereas the early rap records were a guy rapping on top of the same record you might hear Evelyn Champagne King singing on. You mm -hmm. know, <laughs> a, cl a club record, a regular club band playing record. Because it's yours was popular. I started getting demo tapes to my dorm room because the address on it's yours was my dorm room at NYU. I started getting demo tapes and um, Ad-Rock from the Beastie Boys listened to a demo from Ladies Love Cool J oh, and yeah. he was 16. And then I listened to that and I loved it. And then mm -hmm. he ended up coming to the dorm room. We had a meeting 
And uh, his first thing was like, "Ah, oh, Rick Rubin, I thought you were black. <laughs> and, then, um, <laughs> and, uh, and then decided to work with LL and started making records with LL. And, um, and then I, the first LL record was done and I played it for Russell because he had relationships with all the different labels. And I said, what do we do? And he said, well, I guess we'll put it out on profile there. They put out Run DMC. And I said, but when, we're, when we hang out, all you do is complain about profile and how they don't do anything for the artist and they don't pay you and they don't do any of these things. Why don't we just do it ourselves? Mm. And he's like, oh, no, someday I'm going to start a big label. And I said, okay, listen, I'll, I'll make all the records. I'll do all the work. I'll do everything. You be my partner. And he's like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and then, because I knew the reason I, I wanted him to be my partner is, I, again, I'm a kid in school. If yeah. he's my partner, even if I'm doing it, it's it's real. Do you know what I mean? Like it, yeah. it, it made it real because he was a real person and I was a kid in school. So that's how, and I knew that once something started happening, he'd be interested. And as soon as it got, as soon as people started liking it, he got more interested. And it was, it was great. It was a great relationship at that time. Originally you talked about uh, college stations, which is kind of like grassroots recruiting. And eventually you started seeing going from college stations to TikTok to streaming services. So like, how do you feel about that industry kind of switching in order to, you know, advertise and public music? Because nowadays it doesn't matter so much about how good the music is, more so if it's trendy, you know? It really happened. Yeah, has it hurt music, you think? Well, first I'll say it, the only reason hip hop broke through was because the people liked it. It wasn't because the powers that be supported it. The powers that be did not support it. The powers that be did, wanted it to go away and wanted to ban it. So it was truly like a from the street revolution of young people making something they love and caring about it and radio stations being forced to play it just based on popularity. Like it, it, if it's everyone's favorite and the station doesn't play it, the station becomes irrelevant. Right. So, so they saw that they were becoming irrelevant by not playing it. And then the way they started getting into it was just, okay, we'll have a weekend master mix show, Friday night, Saturday night, where we'll play hip hop for a couple of hours. And that was how it started. And then those were the only shows that people listened to on those stations. Or, or they, the ratings on those shows were so much higher than everything else that something could make it from the master mix show into the, you know, tested in the regular playlist, and then records started breaking through. And once they broke through, it it never went back, you know, like it was, uh, it really was a revolution in music. But during that revolution, I know you can't say it, but I have to ask you, who do you think was like one of the best or some of your favorite hip hop, you know, personalities from that time? I always hear LL Cool J say he was the greatest of all time and everything. And, uh, you know, of course, there's a couple of people that can battle for it. But I, I want to know from the early days to start, who was somebody that you're like, they need to hear this. This is unbelievable. Well, I, for me, Run DMC really changed the game. Yeah. Because before Run DMC, it was more like uh, a, a lot of rappers felt like descendants of Parliament Funkadelic. And I love Parliament okay. Funkadelic, yeah. but that was more like, leather boots and more of an R&B slash sci-fi look. Okay, like a Johnny Gill type vibe? Yeah. And then, yeah, okay. but then, um, or, or in its later day of success, like Diddy, you know, Diddy would have been more of an R&B, R&B rapper. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Whereas Run DMC were like B-Boy Street, which, we, which was what we all liked the best. Everyone I knew like kind of the the harder core style of rap yeah. and um and then that led to you know and and that's the lineage like run dmc is what led to nwa and then nwa is what paved the way for wu-tang and yeah. and do you know what i mean like that no, those no. are more like the street the street side of hip-hop there's always been a more polished side and i would say yeah. ll even though he can He's a hard rapper at times. He's still more of a slick rapper. You know, he's more of a, um, he's more elegant yeah. <laughs> and he's beautiful. 
Yeah. Um, so, so in terms of just like the hardest, we liked Run DMC and then NWA and then Wu Tang. <laughs> what, what was the vibes like? I know Run DMC was the prototype for the most part, but when BC Boys came along, what were the vibes like then? How were they accepted? Was it kind of like a thing nowadays? Like, ah, here we go. Like they say, paint white on it and then we throw it out there. <laughs> was it like a thing where people were really like mad hyped to see them? And, and during that time, coming out of Detroit, what was your approach to, you know, to working with them? Were you kind of skeptical of being like it's a white rapper or were you like, bet, Not let's at get all. It. No, no, no. Because <laughs> yeah. it was, all of it was pure because there, there wasn't any thinking about what anybody was going to think. We just loved this music yeah. and did the thing we loved and people liked it. But if they wouldn't have liked it, it would have been okay too. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like we weren't, yeah. <laughs> we weren't doing it to be liked. We were doing it because it's what we liked. Yeah, and um, do you know what I mean? So it was a very yes. personal. There was no when when the Beastie Boys started. It wasn't like there was any possibility that they were going to be a popular band. Right. You know that wasn't realistic. No one was thinking they were going to be big. No one was thinking any hip hop was going to be big. Anyone who was making hip hop records at that time was making hip hop because they loved it, not because you were going to turn into Michael Jackson. Because it was not Michael Jackson. It was this other underground thing that the only people who did it were the people who loved it and the rest of the people didn't even think it was music all right so then let's go back when did you know it was like officially your destiny like when did you know that you, <laughs> like you were locked into this and it was worth i guess picking up from new york and moving to la because not everybody was open to it and so sure but give us that moment where you're like you know what bro hip-hop is here I, I i don't know like i'm i'll say Considering where it came from, to this day, I'm shocked at where it is because you <laughs> couldn't right. ever predict yeah. it. It was not, you couldn't predict it happening. It, it's, it was whatever the most fringe, obscure, small thing was catching on in a way that it changed the whole world. I never saw it happen before with any, I guess the closest example like it 50 years earlier would have been rock and roll, you know? Chuck yeah. Berry and Little Richard and Elvis Presley, yeah. the music before them was different than the music after them. They changed it. Hip hop did that. It like it it changed everything from what was before. And there was there'd be no possible way to know that could be. So so we were so it, it, it was more of a after the early days of Def Jam, we had a lot of success. Um, then Public Enemy came next after uh, after the Beasties and LL and Run DMC. Then was Public Enemy. And then it started feeling like hip-hop was getting big. And when hip-hop yeah. got big, it changed. And in my opinion, it changed for the worse. Because what changed was at that time, in, the, in that immediate time, was that people didn't... It, originally, the people who were doing it were doing it out of the love of this thing and had their own take on it. And you could, you could hear a new, you know, a Mantronics record come out and they'll be like, Whoa, that's really cool. That's different than everything we've heard before. And it was so cool. And, um, and it was like a lot of cool artists making original things and inspiring each other. And then when, when the Def Jam records got big, then all these artists started popping up just sounding like Def Jam artists. And it felt like it's not interesting, you know, like it felt like it all got watered down. Um, and then how'd you get your inspiration from there? I, I know you call yourself a reducer and I, the, <laughs> the, the definition comes from you actually going to the clubs and playing what people hear at the clubs much more than the creative side of it. Is that true or not? Or what? Um, the, 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 re the reducer idea started with, I thought of the word producer means someone who adds things. And to yeah. me, the, like if you listen to my earliest hip hop records, what was different about them than the ones that came before it is I took everything away. I took all the music away and just left the beat and the scratching. And because that was what, to me, what made it hip hop. When I went to the club, that's what hip hop was. Yeah. Drum machines, DJ scratching, break beats, that's what hip hop was. It wasn't a guy rapping over an R&B record. That, and again, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm not, uh, yeah. 
there, I like, I, I can like those records too, and they're good songs, but that wasn't what excited me about it. What excited me about it was there's this whole new language. The DJ is the band. That's, that's cool. I, I love that aspect of it. There was a group called the Executioners of four DJs who just, each one of them would play a part and the four DJs would um, basically make a, create a band just using four DJs all playing different breaks and different parts. It was so cool. So it felt like this whole idea of like the turntablist as the musician, techn- you know, I call it the musician in the group. None of us were musicians, but we all felt the music and the turntable, the idea that the, the DJ is important. That was a big part of it. That was a big part of that, that shift into this new language. That's real. So, Following up with the shift, um, we have this thing called uh, Guns and Butter. It's a segment on our show. Um, it's not like the macroeconomic principle, but it's from a movie scene. You ever seen Baby Boy? Never have. You never have? I'm surprised. Yeah. You've been around enough homies to see. <laughs> it's a Makes John sense. Singleton film. But uh, long story short, in the movie, Vin Reigns talks about uh, Guns and Butter, and he discuss- discusses like the micro decisions that you made now or back in the day that you didn't know that would, would be huge, but they paid dividends in the long run. So we want to know what decisions that you made that you think really set you up to, you know, keep the consistency and the longevity that you've had. Um, I would say probably the number one thing is not listening to anybody, you know, okay. like really following <laughs> my heart yeah, uh, and, and being true to myself. And every time I did something different than the thing I did before. Like I remember when I signed Public Enemy, people were like, that's garbage. And it's like, <laughs> it's the coolest group in the world. That's the yeah. coolest group in the world. And I remember then when I signed Slayer, like you can't sign a heavy metal band, you're the rap guy. Like, I love this band. They're incredible. And, and then when I worked with merch. Johnny Cash, they're like, wow. oh, he's, you know, he's washed up. Why would you want to work with this guy? He hasn't had, you know, he hasn't had a successful record in 20 years. So I don't, I don't follow, like people tell you, and I'm not saying people's, uh, their intentions are bad. Their intentions are good. Yeah. They're, they're basing what they're saying only based on their experience and what their experience is what has come before. And if you're making something that hasn't come before, they don't have any context for that. So that's scary and that's bad. But in reality, the most exciting things are the things that have not come before. It's like, um, I remember uh, there was an, I can't remember who the artist was, but when, when, at, when Prince was really peaking, there was a new artist and they're like, oh, this is the new Prince. This is the new Prince. And, and it was like someone who kind of like wanted to sound like Prince. It's like, that's not the new Prince. The <laughs> new right. Prince isn't going to sound like Prince. Prince yeah. already sounds like Prince. What is, was it his arch rival in Purple Rain? I can't remember. No, I wish. <laughs> I wish. I love him. <laughs> yeah, he was good. No, but I, I, I'm... Morris Day, incredible. Morris Day. Yeah, Morris Day yeah, was Morris incredible. Day. I love Morris Day. Was incredible. Morris Day. Yeah. So I'm, 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 I'm hearing what you're saying right now, and these were a few of the notes I took, and it was from the intention chapter, I believe, and you were saying you know, how society, society dictates rights and wrongs. And, you know, we have these sets of norms that restrict our work before they even start. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that, you know, the greats master the rules so well that they can see past the rules. And that's what we call innovators. And, and yeah. that's, and you said this, so I'm not saying this, you call that innovators or, yeah. or those who never learned the rules in the first place is another way to look at it as well in terms of you know you start in your dorm room and basically you started a, a tech company you know you had a problem you know we talk about this a lot on the podcast you know we, we have the, uh, the athlete side we also have the you know the thought-provoking uh, tech side where if there's a problem uh in our communities we go somewhere else so they can find the they can solve the problem for us but in silicon valley they find a problem and they set up shop themselves and start a company to solve the problem themselves. And so, you know, that's just something that I want to give to the listeners in terms of, you know, what we dissected and and what we gravitated to uh, or resonated with within the book. And so I wanted to ask you something I heard from Yasin Bey, a.k.a. 
uh, Pretty Flacco, a.k.a. Most Deaf. And uh, he was talking with uh, Dave Chappelle. And I'm going to read this verbatim so I don't mess it up. Um, and he was like, you know, let me find it. It's right here. OK, I got it. Uh, the Mer metaphorical whole show, which is essentially. Dave said the product we sell undercuts the art that we actually do. And as a record label. It's in the you have the fiduciary responsibility uh, to the uh, to the uh, investors to make a profit. So how do you separate those two when you're making music and you're not trying to follow trends uh, that people may have been setting along the way? They might have been taking what you've had and created trends outside of what you created. And now you don't want to go outside yourself. So how do you stay um, authentic to who you are and the music you're making? It's it, it's staying authentic to yourself has nothing to do with market conditions. Mm -hmm. you, you don't you don't take I never, ever, ever <laughs> take market conditions into into any decision, creative decision I make ever. I'm making the thing that I want to feel whatever it is. And then, and, and, the, and that's not because I don't care about the audience or I don't care about the business. I know that if I feel it, that's my best chance of someone else feeling it. It's not, it's not a metric that it doesn't work. The best movies aren't made by metrics. <laughs> you know what I mean? The best mm -hmm. movies are made by, you know, people like Quentin Tarantino yeah. who, yeah. who feel it and who are making the thing that's the most important thing to them and that maybe no one else would or could make. Mm -hmm. So the metrics tell you what is. We're making what's not. There's no metrics for what hasn't been yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're always kind of starting from scratch. We're always making the coolest thing we can make. And, you know, there's that old expression, you know, build it and they will come. It's kind of like that. They may come and they may not, but that's not the reason we're making it. So, yes, the responsibility that you have as a leader when someone has invested in you is doing what you think is going to have the best results. Mm -hmm. And what I think is going to have the best results has nothing to do with any metrics. Like if you hear a joke or if you're a comedian and you write a joke and you think it's funny, no one can tell you that it's not funny. It might not be funny, but no one can tell you that you don't think it's funny. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No one can tell you that you're, that the girl that you like isn't beautiful. <laughs> Do you know, like no, one, no, that's real. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? We, <laughs> we all have our own, we see what we see. And when, when we're in, in, when we're involved in creativity, we get to share the thing that we think is the beautiful thing, whatever it is. And it's not for anyone. And if someone else doesn't like it, that's fine. It's not for everybody. It's for us. And no matter what, when you go to sleep at night, you know, whether they like it or not, I know this is my favorite thing. I, there's a quote that you said. It says, I get bored with competing with others, but rather compete with making myself better than the day I was before. As athletes at this level, we definitely resonate with that. But like, how does one go about making themselves better each day? Like, can you elaborate on the mindset once again? Because it sounds so easy to use. I feel like you've given up on public perception years ago, but... Yeah. What's the, the daily intake or effort in order to keep make that mentality, you know, a reality? I, I think right. it's the I think it's a mindset of knowing. It's like I, I also there's a thing about um, competition. I have a weird f relationship to competition. I don't yeah. like I don't like the idea that because I beat someone else that makes me better. I don't really like that. I like the idea that I win because I'm the best I can be. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there was a book called Born to Run, came out about 10 years ago. I think it's recently, I remember reading, there was the um, the anniversary of Born to Run. It's one of the, it's so funny, because I've, I've never been into uh, sports or athletics. And then I read this book, So a friend of mine recommended it to me 10 years ago. And I remember reading, it's a book about running, nothing, I'm something I've never been interested in. And I read the book, I find myself crying. I'm, I can't believe I'm, I'm so upset when the book ends because I don't want it to end because I love it so much. <laughs> and 
one of the stories, one of the stories in Born to Run. Okay, tell me what we were talking about right before this, because Dara has got so deep uh, into competition. That. Oh, competition. I'm the same oh, yeah, way. Competition. Oh, yeah, yeah, competition. There's a story, and one of the stories that actually made me cry in the story. This the book is about the beginning of this uh, ultra marathon craze. So ten years ago, it was a brand new thing, an ultra marathon. So a marathon is twenty three miles, twenty six miles, and um, an ultra marathon is a hundred mile race, mm. and it's a hundred miles not on a track, but a hundred miles through very difficult terrain. So you could be to up mountains, down mountains, wh wh whatever it is, you got to get a hundred miles through a very difficult, and they usually happen in the desert, could be 110 degrees. It's insane. It's an insane race. It sounds terrible, right? <laughs> and the guy who wins the race in the story, his name is Scott Jurek, and he was like the champion uh, ultra marathoner in those days. So he wins the race, and there are probably, I don't know, 40 people in the race. And everybody's crazy. There's no, it's not like tennis where, you know, you become the champion and you become rich. You're killing yourself. And at the end of the race, if you win, they give you a belt buckle. And at the end of the race, if you lose, they give you the same belt buckle. So there's zero incentive other than I just want to do the best I can do. You don't, you don't get any, there's no benefit. So this guy, Scott Jer Jurek, runs this grueling race. He gets to the end of the race. He wins the race. He stands at the finish line after winning to root on every last runner till some one might have been 20 hours after he finished. He wanted to be there to root them on like, we did this. We all did this. And I read that story, and it's like that—that's what a—that's uh, what a superstar is, you know. That's yeah. what a—that's what it's about. It's—it's—it's it's, it's really next level. He's not beating anyone. He—he's leading a charge for all of these people to go past where they think they could go. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And for us, that's all we can ever do is make something and then hopefully the next day make the, make something as good or better. And when I say good or better, it's also tricky because in art, you can't really say what's better. It's always yeah. it's always apples and oranges. Yeah, that's what you said in your book. I, I love what you said. You like, you have to put out art that you like and that you appreciate the most and that you like it because at the end of the day, for it to appeal commercially, there's so many different outliers that have to go into that for something to appeal commercially. It could be the time, the moment, just anything. Yeah, it's and it's all out of our control. The only part that's in control yeah. is the thing that we make. So if we make something we love, that's really our best chance. A after that, it's like, who knows? You know, who knows what's gonna happen? The same, like I, I imagine, does it make a difference when you're, um, let's say you get into the finals, who you're gonna be up against? It must make a difference who wins on the other side. And that's completely out of your control. It is what it yeah. is. And I don't know, does the best team always win? Or does sometimes other things happen and it works out that a team happens to break through in a way that's unexpected, you know, like a, an underdog? It happens, yeah. you know, like yeah, how does that like work? 2015, is right? I mean, I mean, timing is every timing is everything too. I mean, we talk about that. You know, you might be in a better flow state than the best team in that week, and therefore leads you to victory. And you know, I wanted to touch on competition again because it's kind of the new world we live in. You know, as athletes, yeah. you know, I know you asked me earlier, how do you approach the game? I always teach guys, you go into every game with the mindset of ultra competition knowing your opponent. Um, and I guess knowing your opponent would be, you know, it's it's so not true. in it's not in agreement with what you speak on in terms of just focusing on the now and yourself and, and your feelings. But, you know, you got to other people's um, actions uh, create reactions. And, and that's the sport of it all. And now we have gambling. Everybody's betting on every move and who's going to do this and who's going to do that. And so. I'm just speaking on the financial ramifications of everything that we do and how it affects us. And, you know, I, I struggle sometimes with how do we just keep it about the art and not let the financial side of it 
outweigh the art side of it. And and that's been my biggest um, issue with being in sport is that I truly love the game, but the business side of it, uh, it, it turns the actual game sour on me and it affects my mood greatly. You know what I mean? I it's like a daily Absolutely. struggle that I have. I understand. You know, and I sit on these boards, you know, and I have these conversations, you know, whether it be with, you know, uh, with the ownership groups, the governors of teams mm -hmm. or the NBA office or even referees within the game. And I'm, you know, I'm so torn. And then you're emotionally, you get out of whack because you truly care about that art. And uh, it, it throws your mental out of balance as well. And I think that's where a lot of our mental health issues come from is that, you know, we we go about life thinking about how do we make money to make ourselves happy as opposed to just existing as we're supposed to, as supposed to exist as human beings and interactions with other human beings. And, you know, I always say when you master something, whatever you put on earth for, your lifestyle is going to be the way it's supposed to be. And you're going to be ultimately happy. And so I'm just, I'm, I guess that's my spiel, but that's what I struggle with. And competition is at the root of it all because that is where most of the money is coming from. So I, I'm just, you know, want your take on can whatever you, the hell I just said. Can you separate the love and joy of the game from the business? I mean, it's hard to, because, you know, just, I'm in a hotel right now and I'm going downstairs and there's like a hundred people outside asking for autographs and my mind is set on the actual game, you know, and I, I got to focus and, you know, even social media, the social media is probably not good for athletes, but I say all that to say we're encouraged to participate in signing autographs. I mean, you see a kid is cool signing autograph, but you know, if I'm in game mode, that's not on the front of my mind. Mm. Or social media, interact with fans. The NBA is the most uh, technologically advanced league in the world out of all the leagues, so whether it be football, soccer, baseball, so on and so forth. We got the most followers. So we're encouraged to interact with our fan base. But it's more negative than anything. And that really does affect how we think, how we react, you know, how we, you know, speak to people, how we communicate, how we transact. You know, it, it really alters your state. And then you see guys struggle with, identity once the game's all over because it's just gone at the snap of a finger and so you know i have a question. i don't think we go ahead go ahead i have a question if you're at the top of your game and if you excel on the court and if you take the position that for you to do your best on the court you can't do those other things would they still want you to do it? Would they? Would the would the people? Would the powers that be say if you say okay, you you have a choice to the, to the uh, powers that be? I can focus all of my energy on the game and do my very best, or I can focus on these other things that you want me to focus on, and I'm telling you it will have a negative impact on my game. What do you want me to do? What do you prefer? And you could say, I'd prefer to focus on the game. And during off season or downtime, I'm happy to do anything. But when it's game time, I want to do my best. And this is undermining my ability to do my best. How would that, how would that be met? I think it would be met with resistance because I've seen it. You know, I've played in cities where I've been called aloof. I didn't interact with uh, folks in that particular area the way they wanted me to. You know, I'm in that particular city and there's a certain vibe and aura to that city. And, you know, they wanted me to adapt to that. And like I said before, um, I had the same agent as Kobe Bryant. And, you know, that was the, you know, mama mentality. That was the ultimate way to approach your craft. And I seen him and heard about how he approached the game where he would dribble against the wall for 30 minutes with his right hand, 30 minutes for his left hand. Like everything was so finely tuned and detailed with how he was going about his craft. And it goes from how you wake up in the morning, how you meditate, you know, uh, the physical therapy we go through, no one sees, you know, uh, what we put in our bodies, you know, the type of foods that we eat. You know, I took 30 vials of blood to get every uh, 
to understand how every nutrient could possibly work uh, to help or inhibit, you know, me being my ultimate self. Like everything that I do, what I read, you know, who I interact with, all those things can help or hinder my performance on the court. So I'm I'm conscious of all these things. I'm reading your book like it's it's, it's right here in your book. Like when you're when you're really tapped in and you're focused on now, it can it can help or hurt your performance going forward. Mm -hmm. And so it's trying to figure out a way to spread this message. And you said it. And Evan and I talk about this a lot on our podcast. And it's uh, this analytic side of basketball has kind of taken over where they take these numbers that are put in the computer through data that are telling you how to play the game. And Evan and I are more field guys. Like we can look at a guy and we can say, this guy is a great NBA player. But the analytic side of it says, ah, he's not good. And he will miss being in the NBA because a, a data set of numbers said that, you know, he wasn't as efficient as he should be. But we all know that he's a great player. And so we're getting further and further and further away from what I like to call the essence of our art. I understand. And I understand. It sounds we're also, trying to figure out a way to bring it back. Yeah. I, it sounds also like uh, there's a lot of conversation today about AI in creativity and how they're making music now it's yeah and, music. and that that music or uh books or articles it could all be everything could be written by ai and it it isn't really art you know it's it's something but the same like if if all if basketball is simply computer versus computer analytics versus analytics right is it even basketball anymore do you, do you know what I'm saying? Is it just <laughs> a computer you. game now? No, it, it, you're absolutely right. And it, the analytics say that, like, to go towards everybody shooting 40% from the three. So pretty soon, if you're looking at analytics, analytics, and you grab every mojo and Larry that's shooting 40% from the three, and that's all that matters to a certain extent, now the rest of the game is going to drop. You already see right away the defense is down. There's a 40 or 50-point game every single night. So in music, that's like someone going platinum down there every second. It's something, there's also something about like, you know, once the four minute mile was broken, it, it, no one could do it until someone did it. And then once someone oh, yeah. did it, yeah. a lot of people could oh, do yeah. it. There is yeah. something about when you break, when you, it's like the people's understanding of reality changes when yeah. a, when a, when there's a record broken. As soon as yep. we understand it can be done, that changes things. That's also why yeah. when we're, you know, as artists or creative people, starting with the idea that it can be done, whatever crazy thing it is, is a really healthy way to go about doing stuff. Just because no one did it before doesn't mean it can't be done. just means we haven't done it yet. Yeah. And to always be in that mindset of, I feel like there's a way to do this. I'm going to figure out how to do this. If you see a way in, maybe you see a way in that no one else saw before, or maybe you're willing to outwork everyone in a way that no one else was willing to do it before hearing the story about Kobe's dribbling, you know? Yeah. So I told a story like only like once or twice, but I remember being in the game against the Detroit Pistons and um, Rip Hamilton was one of my favorite players when he was in college at UConn. Like, I remember drawing on my notebook in school, like, his name in bubble letters and after they won a national championship. So, like, he was one of my favorite players. And so playing against him, uh, I was kind of in awe. And so I was telling Allen Iverson, like, man, this dude's an all-star. Like, he's so good. He doesn't get the respect he deserves. And Allen Iverson, he was, like, my big brother. He was so cool with me. He was always telling others how good I was as a rookie. Mm -hmm. And this was the probably the first time he kind of snapped at me. And he was like, man, you better than all of them. Like, I don't, I don't ever want to hear you talk about somebody being good. Because, like, I would go into the game, certain games, excited. Like, he would see me excited against Vince Carter. He would see me excited against uh, Kobe Bryant. You know, he would see me excited against uh, Rasheed Wallace was one of my favorite players in college, you know, Carolina guys. And so, you know, he kept reminding me, like, you're that guy. Like, stop giving other guys so much credit. And, you know, because the NBA is, is all about confidence. Like, confidence can make or break you. You know, Evan and I talk about that all the time. You know, you go on a 10-game streak where you're playing well um, and your confidence is at an all-time high because you can just be free. And it's only two guys per team in the entire NBA who truly play how they want to play. Everyone else has to take 
a little less of their game off the table for the greater good of the team, or they should, or, and the, or the team just doesn't work. And so that confidence thing was really big for me. And I tell everybody that going into games, like, hey, whatever your role is tonight, be ultra confident in that. It's almost like a band. Like, you know, mm-hmm. you may not get a solo tonight, but I want you to kill, you know, your your drum part in this and bombs over Baghdad because it's what 112 beats per per minute. You know yeah. what I mean? So I want you to be super. Amazing. But the next song, you may only have five beats per minute, but I want you to be per- perfect in your role um, no matter when or, or, or what time it may come. Is there any sense like in the example of when you're playing against a player who you really love and respect? and you think is great, where the the initial awe changes over the course of the game to more like, this is something we're doing together? So for me, you know, there, and, and you spoke about this in terms of competition, and, and it's frowned upon to be friendly with guys in the game. And they always say, how are you going to be friends with a guy uh, and compete against them? But I actually think when I played against Evan Turner, I was locked in because I knew how good he was. Yeah. And I only surround myself with people who are either, you know, really smart uh, or, or bring value to me as a person. Like I, I take a lot from that person. Like there's something about them that I think I don't have or I don't have as well as I want to have. And 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 they kind of bring it out of me. Beautiful. So Evan's that guy. Beautiful. So when I played against him, like I would be super locked in. <laughs> and, and I don't know. I, I never knew what E.T. was thinking. Like, man, he playing hard against me. And I'm like, bro, I know how good you are. Like, I know you can beat us yeah. um so i had that mindset and then we spoke about this earlier in terms of you know competition versus inspiration and so like my favorite players when i played against them it wasn't really competition like you're saying i played with them it was like yeah we were playing together and it was yes. ultimate inspiration like i had my yes. best games against kobe bryant i had my best games against him yes. like my first game in la i'll never forget that game it was probably one of the best games of my life like and, and i was young and but I was just everywhere at one time, but yeah. it was just inspiration I had got from him, and he did that for everybody. And I think yeah. that's why he's considered one of the greatest because everybody was so excited to go up against him and show him their best, and he still came out the best player. And, and I think that's <laughs> the you know the ultimate respect. I think I'm thinking about something that we were talking about right before this about the uh, social media aspect versus what happens on the court. And it almost sounds like there are two separate separate things going on. And one is the athletics of the game. And the other is, I guess the word would be celebrity because the, you know, how many likes you have is about celebrity. It's not about yeah. how good of a player you are because, yeah. and if it was about how good of a player you are, then if you focus just on the game, then those numbers would go up. And I do have a feeling if you really focused on the game and it showed those numbers would go up. I think. You but, tell but me. That's, a, that's a great point. And, and ET, you could chime in on this, but when you're surrounded by nothing but cameras, like we have a dedicated crew just for social media. And, you know, I'm in, I'm big on business myself. Like I invest in startups, you know, Mm -hmm. I have ownership stake in a few uh, professional teams and outside of basketball. Mm -hmm. And so I'm paying attention to all these things too, because I have to put my, 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 my business cap on. And so, you know, I'm following other great businessmen and how they work. And so now we're saying it's just become a part of the game and generation Z, this new generation, they just don't watch uh, basketball or TV traditionally the way we did and so they're consuming on different platforms and so we have to cater to that in order to fulfill the financial like i said the fiduciary responsibilities to the shareholders and to myself investing my time and money into having ownership as well and so now we just caught up in the rat race (laughs) you know what i mean yeah 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 and so but 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 it's all around us is there a way you you used a great expression which is you put your business cap on is there a way to take the business cap off at the times when it's in your best interest to take the business cap off and put all of yourself into the game? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And and I do that, but sometimes I might get backlash because I'm so like, and I think this is what, you know, this is like one of the moments, like, you know, I'll be vulnerable. I feel like this kind of hurt Evan Turner 
because he should be playing basketball right now. But he just got sick of the nonsense and it wasn't about basketball anymore. It was about, you know, perception. Yeah. Uh, it was about, you know, uh, we're going young now, you know, uh, you know, like losing is a strategy in sports now, wow. you know what I mean? To get wow. a better draft pick. Wow. You know what I mean? Wow. And so I'm watching my brother go through trauma and, you know, all everyone can say is, well, that's what the paycheck is for, you know, to, to, to release you from your traumas, but no one's understanding that, you know, there's no amount of money that can relieve someone's trauma. And so I'm, I'm just identifying all these things and I'm putting all these things in my mental roller decks to say, all right, these, this is the issue that I'll try to solve for with upcoming athletes to, to, to lead them to, you know, a happier life experience, which, which will ultimately lead them to be better athletes. I will hope. Beautiful. I love that. I have, I have a, 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 a strange basketball question. I honestly don't know. I know almost nothing about basketball, but uh, at one point I was watching some games and there was the, uh, I noticed different than from my childhood, uh, there's the thing called the flop. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to understand both the psychology of the flop and why it has taken, like why it's so con it, it, ubiquitous in the game now. And is it good or bad for the game? I want to hear Evan's take, but we're both anti-floppers. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm like anti flop to be honest with you, it it I just don't think it's good for the game at all. Um, I understand like when James Harden was doing it, get to the free throw line, and you know those type of tricks of the trade. You can see it from 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 certain areas, but like when you're preparing to really prepare and be like, hey, when I'm in a battle right now, I'm in a DJ battle. If it get ugly, I'm just gonna prepare for. <laughs> Yep. Or like, you know what I mean? I'm going to prepare and act like my, my turntable just messed up. Like, do you wow. understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you're going to, when you say preparation or confidence, it's like, all right, bro, I'm be confident enough to step up and hit this shot and shake them and get to the rack and lay it up. But like, sometimes it comes off as like, do you lose your confidence when you're going to the rack trying to hope the referee calls a foul for you on some bullshit that you did? Yeah. I think, I, I, to be honest with you, for lack of better terms, I think it's lame as fuck. Especially yeah. when you see uh, you get guys like the Kyle Lowry's or certain guys that made a living off until you hit playoffs and then they didn't know how to really make shit happen from there. You know what I mean? But what what do you think, Trey? So that's, I mean, it's very similar. I think flopping came from, oh, I mean, let me not get in trouble. Like, you know, Rick, you know, as, as one of the elder statesmen in basketball, like my word, uh, spreads fast so if i say something controversial <laughs> controversial is like blown out of proportion it's not even controversial it's just the truth of the matter and like people don't like being you know they don't like the facts sometimes yeah but i uh there's gamesmanship and there's flopping yeah there's, so those are those are they're similar but they're very different and so like michael jordan had great gamesmanship like he knew how to take angles or he knew certain moves he can get away with uh the referees couldn't see or, like there's a story i told this before kobe bryant read the whole officiating manual and he knew where the referees would be stationed on the floor he knew where he can get away with a few things that the referees couldn't see gamesmanship mm -hmm. but like et said flopping doesn't stand the test of time like a true artist will know you're flopping and the best refs are always in the finals or they should be and they and, and it doesn't work and then you just now you're stuck and now you have you're to really play yeah now, now your your weaknesses are really highlighted and spotlighted, and you can't perform because you you've cheated the game with flopping. I think flopping is cheating yeah. the game, but I do think it came from being overseas. Like soccer invented flopping, and then it went uh, into basketball overseas into the uh, Olympics, and when we start playing uh, Olympics, and so the NBA wants to go global. So now we have this um, we have this thing where we we really embrace embrace and we really shine and highlight. Um, players from overseas now the cream of the crop they're them they, their game will they, they'll be great but we have a lot of guys from overseas they qu can't quite hack it but they get by for a couple of years flopping and then i think <laughs> a lot of the african-american players we perfected that shit and once we perfected it now it's frowned upon yeah. that's my personal take wow have you um can you remember a particular game where you where you were flopped upon where you were called because the other person flopped and what's the feeling when you experience it live, you know you didn't do anything wrong, 
the other person is really doing showbiz on the ground. What does it feel like? I want to keep the ball in the stands. Yeah, or you lucky, guy, man. Get, get your bitch ass up. Like, yeah. ain't, it ain't even wet over here. Like, yeah. that, yeah. like that type of... No, but it's frustrating. J.J. Barea used to really do it. And um, J.J. Barea, 5'9", 160 pounds. And, like, say you get an Andre Iguodala that's 6'6", six, six, yeah. 210. Yeah. Or I might be 235 on a bad day. You're already starting off looking bad posting them up. The second you move or take a dribble, eyes are usually he was flailing. And that's what is probably tough because you get an offensive foul, a turnover, and then we start breaking it down to analytics. All that stuff matters. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I wanted to ask you one more question. Yeah. Because um, I saw a little baby say something about it, and then you mentioned it in your book. And um, I think it was something to say that art is basically just art. You can't rely on art or do art under pressure in order to, you know, make you money or like financial gains. Like yeah. you have to be, can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah. It's a little bit like w- what I was saying about doing, doing your best on the court versus celebrity, that they're two separate things. And yeah. when you're making art, all that matters is the art. And then when the art's done and there are no more creative choices to make, it's like you've, you're ready to release it into the world. Then you can put your business cap on and at that time say, okay, what's the best way to get this to the most people? What's the, but you don't, you don't put your business cap on before that. You don't put your business cap on while you're making it so mm-hmm. that the, the, um, the commercial aspects of it don't uh, undermine the, the, the purity of the art that you're making. Because the purity of the art you're making is the thing that that's always what's going to live on forever. That's the thing, you know, that's the, uh, it's funny. Um, in the past, I've been involved with big record companies as well as independent record companies. And a conversation I overheard at a big record company is like, how do we get the artist to like go along with this plan? It's like, you don't want to come up with a plan that you have to get the artist to go along with. You want to find the plan that that artist is most excited about and is going to put themselves into it because that's what they want to do and they feel good about it and it's true to them and it's not cookie cutter you don't have you don't come up with the plan that worked for artist A and give it to all the other artists now because that's what we do now that's not how it works you have to see what's right for this artist what's important to this artist and how do we how do we change essentially how do we change the business to support the artists because in the music business, we're not selling anything but the music. It's like, it's all, the only product is the art. That's all there is. So if we don't treat that as the most important thing, we're doing ourselves a real disservice when we're trying to sell this thing that we're making. It's like, if we're saying, oh, I know it's not really ready yet, but it'd be good to put it out for Christmas. So we're gonna rush it out. We're not doing any favors for anybody. Do you know what I'm saying? We're not. Yeah, that's real. We're not doing it for, we're not. It's not good for the artist. It's not good for the company. It's not good for anyone, but it's that short-sighted mentality of the people who don't make art. They see it like, okay, there's a conveyor belt and the best time to put out the new, the new release. We got the new shoes coming out. Best time to put it out is this month. So we just plan it to come out that month. With art, it's not like that because it doesn't come out when you want it to come out. You can release it when you want, but in terms of the making of it, you can't make it on a schedule. It doesn't happen on a schedule. It's out of our control. We're waiting for inspiration. We're waiting for um, the, the, you know enough good songs to come, finding the way to, to present the song in a way that's exciting to you, all those things. Sometimes it falls together really fast. Sometimes it takes forever. And we don't control that. It's like it's magic. It really is magic when it happens. We just are in awe when it does happen. It's a great feeling. But to go past it, like uh, I'll go into the studio with an artist and they'll play me a song like, I think this is my first single. It's like we haven't even listened to any of the songs yet and you're already thinking about (laughs) what the first single is. like, you know, one demo out of 30, this is going to be the first single. It's like that's no way to think about it. 
do, do you know what I'm saying? Like, yes. let's make the best body work we could possibly make. And then after we have the best body work we could possibly make, then we could put on our business hat and say, okay, now we have this thing that we love. It's beautiful. Can't be better. How do we share this with the world? What's the best way to get it out there? And then it's fine making those um, marketing decisions and promotion decisions, but not at the expense of the art, always after. Okay. I appreciate Beautiful. that. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Well, thank you for the time, sir. I truly appreciate it, man. Yeah, um, me too. Yeah, yeah. This my, is this is pleasure. probably one of the few one of the few books that I'll um I'll frequent, you know, like I'll read it through and through multiple times, man. I think this is a gem. I think everyone can learn something from it. Uh I'll make this um uh, mandatory reading. I know my son, I'm gonna make him read it ASAP. And uh, just thank you, man. Appreciate it again. My pleasure. And hit me after they after they check it out and let me know how it makes them feel. I'm I'm always curious to know how people resonate with it. I'm, it really makes me happy that you feel it, and um and that from our conversation, I get the feeling that you feel like it can relate to sports. And I think it's beautiful because I come from a music background, but I don't think what we're talking about is about music. I feel like it's yes. uh it's about it's about how to be good at whatever the thing that you want to do and live uh, true to yourself in the world and um, the good that can come from that. That's real. Yes, sir. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.